Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our session on this rainy afternoon. We are here today to talk about Human Capital Initiative postgrad courses, and we will answer questions either at the end of the webinar or in an FAQ document, which will be circulated to you afterwards. You will notice on the right hand side of uh, your screen, you have space for posing your questions and uh, we will answer them today. So what is Human Capital Initiative? HCI for short, pillar one. It's an initiative offering incentivized places for graduate to reskill in areas of skill shortages and also in emerging technologies. For example, in ICT, high-end manufacturing, sustainability, and so on. And we have many courses here for you at UCC. These courses are at level eight, higher diploma, and at level nine, postgraduate diploma. And you can see them here on the right-hand side indicated on the National Qualifications Framework Wheel. Today, we will talk about who can apply. So job seekers, those in receipt of an eligible payment from the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection and the formerly self-employed. Also returners are eligible, those not in receipt of payment from the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection that have been out of work, out of the work environment for a number of years, but who may require upskilling or reskilling to transition back into the workforce. And also those in employment are eligible, those who wish to upskill or reskill. Courses are free for job seekers and for returners. And those of you who are in employment, you will receive a 90% fee subsidy from the HEA. So that's all good news all around. Shortly, I'll start chatting to one of the six uh, course director. So first will be Dr. Dr. Fiona Chambers, and we'll talk about innovation through design thinking course. After her, we will talk to Dr. Patrick Crowley, who is going to share more knowledge about languages and global software business course. Then we will speak to Dr. Owen Fleming, and we learn all, all about design and manufacture of biopharmaceuticals. And following Owen will be Eric, Dr. Eric Moore, he will talk to us about bioanalytical chemistry. And we stay uh, in this uh, arena with Dr. Patrick O'Dwyer, and we'll talk about pharmaceutical regulatory sciences. And then last but not least, I will speak to Dr. Marguerite Nyan, who is, who is going to talk to us about sustainability in enterprise, meeting the challenges of the future. So these will be the six uh, course directors. And then Katie Sandem uh, will talk to us about the frequently asked questions, the questions that are probably on your mind right now. Can I continue working while studying? Will I keep my job seekers related payment? I'm not Irish. Can I apply for a HCI course? Are all HCI courses online? And what will happen to my COVID payment? And also what would happen if I'm if I find employment while I start studying this HCI course. So all these questions will be answered for, uh, for us uh, towards the end of the webinar. Let's uh, welcome Dr. Fiona Chambers and let's talk to her a little bit about her program. Fiona, what is design thinking? Um, first of all, hi Lenka and thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so um, delighted to welcome everybody that's listening today. Um, design thinking is human-centered innovation and it's basically learning how to design in order to enhance user experience and it always begins with empathy or compassion in order to understand a user or a customer's unmet needs so essentially what we're trying to do in design thinking is to develop solutions to complex problems and they can be products processes or services and even strategy design and we spend about 80% of our time um, on the problem and 20% on the solution, which is kind of unusual, I think, as humans to do that. There are three features to design thinking, Lenka. Um, there's the mindset, which everybody's going to learn about in this program. And there's also that really iterative and very data-driven process, which we're going to learn about too. And also how to use space most effectively to get the most from the design thinking teams. Design thinkers um, have particular attributes and um, they have a professional curiosity. And uh, we would describe them as prosumers. So they produce knowledge and they consume it. 
they're problem finders, but they're also problem solvers and they're systems thinkers. So they understand complexity. And finally, I think this is really important to be persuasive around design. They're storytellers. I think that's probably the most interesting one. That sounds really interesting. So what's in it for me? Why should I study this course and not to choose something else? Well, if, if you're choosing to study um, design thinking, um, basically just, I suppose, if we're to think about the, the type of context we're in currently, we're in a pandemic and everybody is reimagining the future. Um, so therefore, we really need to be able to manage local and global problems using human-centered design. So that cookie cutter or a product line kind of model is not going to work anymore. So we've got to think a bit differently about it. And the phrase I would use is that design thinking has become our superpower. And um, so people who actually do this course or are interested in doing this course, they're not only going to increase their breadth of knowledge, they're also going to learn leadership expertise. So it's it's there's a lot of, I suppose, um, opportunity the way we've designed this course to manage that. And I'd like to give you a little flavor of what the program might entail just for those listening. So the first thing I would say, um, Dave Salmon and Joe Feller and myself have I suppose highlighted or spotlighted three literacies in this program. We've called out design thinking, but actually buried within this program, there are actually three. There's a design, digital and data literacies. And there's a sweet spot intersection there. We call that the D cubed space. And um, we have a very unique teaching team. So we are a combination of the School of Education, the business school. We also have a very significant network that we're drawing on in terms of visiting professors. And we have a wide range of industry partners as well. So those who, who, who choose this program are building a professional network from the get go. And that's a real selling point, I believe. The other thing I would say to you is that learning and teaching approaches on this program are very, very interesting. We're using an action research method, which is projects based. Um, and it's all about projects that matter. We're not making up projects for you to do. So they can be live projects if you're somebody in employment currently. And for those not in employment, uh, there, we have project sponsors from those industry partners. And we will have culminating events, uh, design festivals and design events to allow everybody to disseminate what's going on and to really get themselves visible in the design world um, as they're doing the program. And finally, I think that the really, really interesting thing um, will be the fact that we the pedagogy or how you learn and teach um, uh, design thinking. That's also a golden thread in this program. And that means that we're, we're teaching you um, to fish, you know, that lovely phrase. We're going to teach you how you teach others to do this, because that's the whole important part of this, that you could bring this back to an organization or into a new job. And it's a real selling point, I believe, for employers, if you can do that as well. Yeah, you bring up really good points. And, and let's talk about the career opportunities so that come after this course. What what will I be able to, what companies will I be able to approach or who is going to be going after my skills? Sure. So if, if you can think about this question, I pose this question. So anybody who's listening who wants to drive innovation, growth, and uh, where the customer's experience is central, this program is for you. You can find a job in government, in civil society and NGOs or in industry, any place basically that relies on understanding user experience. And there are very specific jobs that will suit you. And they're in anything that is to do with the creative, design, customer experience, engineering, innovation, product development, research and development, strategy and user experience. And just, I suppose, to finish, um, Lenka, I'd, I'd like to point out that there is a scarcity of, of those who can actually do this. So if, if you have time, anybody listening, please look at the Future Skills Needs Expert Group, their report that came out this summer. And Andrew Barrett, who's the chair of that group, called out that the design focus is in 2.8% of all jobs in Ireland, but we're underserving that particular um, employee sector. We need more designers across every single sector. And um, so we need you. We need you to sign up for the program. You're going to really enjoy it. Um, and I, I, I really look forward to meeting you, as does Dave and, and Joe and the rest of the team. So thanks so much for having the opportunity to talk to you, Lenka. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you for sharing uh, all about the course with us. And there is more information, of course, on our website. 
and uh, maybe staying with this topic uh, and shortage of scales and the demand from our uh, industry partners. I'd like to start uh, speaking to you, Patrick, about your course. And let's start with the latest change. So you have a, a bit of news for us here today. There was a slight title change for this course. We used to call it Global Software Sales Support and Localization. And now uh, maybe more appropriately, we call it Languages and Global Software Business. So why that change? Yeah, thanks, Lenka. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question, and, and I'm delighted to be able to answer it. So we developed this um, higher diploma um, in conjunction with um, um, our partners in industry. So industry, in, in for example, VMware, Apple, um, click the mention in Cork, were saying that there was a, a shortage of highly skilled language graduates coming into the industry. And they really need those language graduates because those language graduates have in very important skills. They have linguistic competency, they have intercultural skills, um, and they are really creative in terms of problem solving. And so one of the areas, one of the massive growth areas worth something like $45 billion globally is the area of localization. And our industry partners are saying that's the area we need our language graduates to enter into. So we developed this, the, the, uh, we developed this uh, higher diploma, but of course we weren't thinking about the key people we're trying to attract in, the language graduates. So we thought, look, why don't we just make it very clear that it's about languages? So it's about languages and the global software business, because what we're talking about is smart, very competent language graduates who are interested in getting into this, into the um, IT and software industry. So it's about two skill sets coming together, the fabulous skill sets that language graduates have, and then the complementary skill sets that our colleagues who have developed this with us from Business Information Systems at UCC, with Professor Joe Feller and Jeremy Hayes, we've brought these two skill sets together in wonderful complementary ways. And we think it's it's not just about conversion, it's about bringing these uh, two strong skill sets together and to help uh, support uh, graduates who want to move into this, I mean, extraordinarily expanding industry. Yeah, that sounds really good. Really good. So imagine I, I am a language graduate and I would like to transition into the business world. So what skills will I gain in this course? What's in it for me? What is this course going to teach me? I have the language, but what else will you teach me? Okay, so the, the course is made up in two parts. The first part, um, I think, um, just makes it kind of revisits kind of language competency, intercultural skills. And then what it brings in from the from the languages side is this issue of localization. And localization, as, as I mentioned earlier, is, 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 is a key area where, you know, uh, it is expanding all the time. And localization is about translating and adapting a product to a particular culture, a particular language, a particular geographic region. So how do you translate the product? across worlds where different languages are spoken. So we have a, a very specific module on localization and the requirements of localization that will bring those skills into that area. In addition to that, uh, we look at the, the fundamentals of IT, sales support and analysis, technology support, but also in the alternate sessions that we'll be doing on Fridays, Friday afternoons, We'll be working on professional development. We'll be working on teamwork. We'll be looking at developing leadership skills. And we'll be introducing our cohort to key industry speakers. They'll be coming in on a Friday, talking about the industry, making sure that the kinds of things that we do throughout the program are aligned with industry needs. And so in that sense as well, we'll be developing those critical leadership skills that are important within the industry. And if you like, one use of the word we've talked about of upskilling, but this is about kind of kind of kind of new skill set complementing the skill sets that good language graduates have. And then I suppose if I was to look for one word, it's also about communication. How do you communicate a problem a product? How do you communicate when there are difficulties of understanding across different cultures? That's the kind of thing and those are the kinds of skills uh, within the IT sector and, 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 and software that we would be looking at. 
That sounds fascinating. And tell me a little bit about my career opportunities so I complete this uh, course. What's in it uh, out there in Cork, in our region? Will I get employment straight away? We received um, a, a, an email from uh, Catherine Fitzpatrick, who is the International Relations Officer for Cork Chamber, asking us to meet with um, eight representatives from the so IT and software industry in the Cork and Munster area. They are crying out for language graduates in that field. Um, in discussions, we've been we've, in, in preparing this higher diploma, We've had meetings with um, VMware, with McAfee. Um, we know that out there, WorkVivo and Cork, VMware, Dell, EMC, Apple, is, Ireland is the hub within Europe. But within Ireland, it's the Cork and Munster region that is the key area of growth in this, in, in, in this field of, of IT and software. And so they're the people that are coming to us saying we need these graduates and this is these are the kinds of platforms um that actually have um developed even more and expanded even more as a result of covid because it's all about development of these online platforms for sales uh, and the promotion of different products across the world so they really do need these graduate students and we were in contact as well with Siobhan Bradley from Southwest Regional Skills, and she was making a similar case that there is a shortfall in strong graduates with great problem solving skills, creative responses to difficulties in the IT area. So we feel absolutely certain on the basis of our discussions with key uh, stakeholders that um, there will be um, jobs at the end of this uh, diploma. Sounds fascinating. And my own background is, you know, I worked for Apple and for Marriott, Starwood Hotels and Resorts. I definitely give you a plug for this course. And I think there's wonderful uh, need and all the people completing this course will really benefit and the employment opportunities are vast. So thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Take care. And we are going to switch gears a little bit and uh, go into a slightly different industry. And I would like uh, to welcome Dr. Owen Fleming. And Owen, tell us a little bit, uh, why is it a good time to join biopharma sector? Thank you, Lenka. So I suppose globally, we've seen a huge growth and in investment in the biopharma sector in the last number of years. And this kind of dates back to, to the sequencing of the human genome a little under 20 years ago. And what this has done is it has provided us with incredible insight into how cells work and how, uh, when cells go wrong, diseases begin to develop. So I suppose the research that has been done since uh, the human genome has been sequenced and a little bit prior to that has allowed for the development of a number of new, uh, what we call biotherapies, novel biotherapies. And look, I suppose there's been quite a success in some of these in the last number of years. We've seen a lot of very successful monoclonal antibodies being developed and used. We've seen gene therapies beginning to develop. So really what we're seeing now at this particular point is a significant investment from the companies in order to support and to further drive these technologies, okay? So, so everything from the development of new vaccines, I suppose this is very pertinent at the moment in terms of, of our COVID-19 situation, but developing vaccines, developing immunotherapies, uh, new cell-based therapies, gene therapies, that a lot of these uh, uh, opportunities are now beginning to materialize and the companies are investing very heavily in developing these technologies. So for example, we've seen in the last uh, week or so that Johnson & Johnson ha have made a significant purchase of, of, of a biopharma company in the US, something similar with Sanofi. And I think there's just the realization that this is where the, 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 the therapies are at at the moment and trying to invest in that and trying to develop that. And I suppose I would follow on from the point there that Patrick was making that, 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 that I suppose this is what's happening globally. But here in Ireland, we're very lucky in terms of, of, of being this kind of European hub in terms of, of the presence of major pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies uh, here in the country. And certainly within the greater Munster area, we're very fortunate in terms of having a number of the big players from Regeneron to, to, to Janssen, Eli Lilly, 
uh, 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 Genzyme. So, so there's huge numbers of, 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 of these companies within the Cork area. There are a lot of opportunities within them. And look, uh, what we're seeing is that they're all investing heavily in new facilities, uh, in, in new technologies, and they're looking for people to fill new opportunities that are, are arising within the companies. Sounds fascinating. You know, my previous studies were not linked to biopharma. And many of our listeners here today, they may not have any background in, in this area. Yeah. And I'm looking for a fresh start. So is this course for me and what skills would I gain? So what we're seeing, and again, uh, no more than the previous uh, comments there from, from, from Patrick, we engage with some of the local skills forums. And that's our, our I suppose, our gateway to talking to some of the, the, the local companies, the, the, the players. And it's very evident, you know, as part of the expansions that they're undergoing, that there are requirements for new skills that wouldn't necessarily have traditionally been associated with biopharma. So, you know, previously we would have been looking for maybe biochemists and microbiologists and engineers. But now because of these expansions, there are opportunities for people from a very wide uh, and diverse background of experiences and academic qualifications. So, you know, we, we will be looking to upskill people and, you know, the whole course is, 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 is it is a conversion course, uh, allowing us to, to, I suppose, take people from diverse backgrounds and give them an understanding and an appreciation of what's going on within the biopharma sector. So, for example, there's modules on, on um, you know, how cells work and how when disease happens, how cells go wrong and how it is opportunistic for us to develop specific biological medicines in order to solve biological problems. So there's the, we'll be giving people skills in that particular space. Um, we will also, there's a module on bioprocessing, what's called upstream and downstream processing. And this is really what goes on within uh, the larger biopharmaceutical companies in terms of getting cells maybe to make a, a, a protein, a biological drug, and then purifying the biological drug. So we have modules on that, as well as modules on the manufacturing process within a sterile environment. So obviously in terms of producing drugs that are going to go into human patients, they have to be produced in, 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 in a sterile environment. Um, and there it's done in a very highly regulated environment. So again, we have modules that will be uh, explaining these sorts of, of concepts to the students. Um, we will also have a module on process and chemical engineering because I suppose one of the challenges is, 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 is to, to, to produce these drugs at a sufficient level that we can try and drive down the cost of them. So one of the aspects associated or the elements central to that is how these uh, uh, biopharma processing plants are, are engineered. So we have a, a module from them. Um, we also have a module on validation and verification of the process, making sure that we're making the protein drug that we're, we're trying to make and making at a sufficiently high standard. Then at the very end of, 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 of the year, we're hoping that uh, the last week of April and the first week of May, we'll bring our students in on campus in order to do a, a, a kind of a hands-on training exercise. And this will be complemented by simulated training. There's a module on this simulated training that would really give these, these, these students from a broad range of backgrounds the opportunity to really see what's involved in making these protein drugs. We'll have cells that will make the drug, we will purify it, we will characterize it. So it really provides an overview, a very, uh, I suppose, hands-on overview of what's involved within the biopharma industry. That sounds really, really interesting. Uh, tell me a little bit in a nutshell about careers. So who would employ me then? Who is going to be looking for me and my skills? Yeah, so, so that I think depends on the skills that you would bring into the course. So, so you know, some people will come in with very diverse backgrounds that are, not, are backgrounds that are not in the science and engineering field. And we would be hoping that they would be uh, able to look for, for technical or operator roles uh, once they've gotten the qualification. For those coming in from different backgrounds, they would be able to maybe fulfill uh, uh, QA roles, our, our, our lab scientist roles out in industry. Um, and look, I suppose Patrick touched on it the last time that there is a, a need for people with languages. And um, this is one of the things that was picked up in, in you know, in our interactions with the, 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 the biopharma industry. They're looking for people with languages 
with IT skills, with uh, uh, mathematical backgrounds, uh, capable of doing data analysis. So really what we're hoping our course will do is it will kind of link up people with these uh, uh, previous experiences and academic qualifications and really upskill them and convert them so that they're in a position where they can appreciate what goes on and how their qualifications are relevant within the biopharma industry. Thank you, Owen. Thank you so much for joining us here today. That was really informative. Thank you. And now we stay uh, with this uh, topic and uh, Dr. Eric Moore will join me now and we'll talk a little bit more about bioanalytical chemistry. Welcome, Derek, uh, Eric. Thank you, Lenka, and good afternoon, everybody. So um, the, the postgrad diploma in bioanalytical chemistry, it's a, it's a level nine qualification that will provide knowledge of bioanalytical chemistry as applied in the in the biopharmaceutical industry. So very much following on from the, the conversation and topic that Owen um, was just talking about. So our program, um, it aims to deliver a broad scope of industry relevant bioanalytical topics that will give students viable insight and raise their awareness of the importance, implementation and impact of bioanalytical chemistry. Um, our modules are, are designed basically to give uh, or, or to, to deliver a more in-depth ap appreciation of the latest trends of bioanalytical techniques and state-of-the-art as well in terms of the, the analytical technologies that are currently um, in use in the, in the biopharmaceutical industry. And I suppose finally then, um, training is provided in a, in a wide range of bioanalytical analysis methods. Things like chemometric skills, literature searching, troubleshooting and problem solving are very key to the program and also our transferable skills such as scientific writing and presentation skills because there'll be opportunities as well within this um, to you know present on the project that the students will, will, will do as part of the course um, so they can basically showcase the work that they've been doing and give them an opportunity to disseminate their activities. Thank you. So in order to, to study your course, I would have to have a science or engineer, engineering degree, correct? So correct. why would it be important for me to study it a bit further? Why to go into the bioanalytical chemistry area? So I suppose in terms of, of, of bridging that gap between theory and practice, it's, it's a key, it's a key, um, it's a key driver here. So, I mean, we've designed this program to enable our graduates to meet um, priority skills for the, for the bio for the biopharmaceutical sector and uh, a key aspect of this program is the partnering with with several industries like um, Pfizer's Regeneron um, Eli Lilly Johnson and Johnson workshop and Doan and so forth that provide valuable insight and skills and knowledge that really do bridge that gap between academic teaching and industry practice um, I suppose a major feature of the program is the proactive collaboration with industry. Industry are key to this because they are coming in at the beginning to help design and deliver the curriculum. Um, and this is highly innovative in terms of the approach that we're adapting here. And we see this as significantly enhancing the student learning experience. Um, like I said, this is this is very much an industry-led, industry-driven program. Uh, for example, you know, students will, will gain hands-on experience with industry partners through our dedicated industry workshops. Um, these will be delivered by the companies uh, and basically we just facilitate that. Um, there's also virtual gaming and these are based on industry scenarios. So there'll be a number of scenarios that industry have uh, and the students will have to go through these and troubleshoot, um, you know, real life problems that, that these companies would have would, would have had in the past. And also through, you know, um, participation in virtual and also on campus laboratories. Again, this is a very important aspect for us because, you know, this is an application driven program and the applied nature is very important that we can actually get the students to put the theory into practice. And, uh, you know, the virtual labs are great, especially in this environment where a lot of people are working from home. But there will be an opportunity, um, you know, in the summer because our program, our, our lectures would pretty much start, we're starting our workshops in December, but the core of our lectures will be delivered in semester two. And then our, our kind of applied aspects will be delivered in semester three during the summer side of it. Um, and we should have an opportunity for the students to come on campus and, and have a, a laboratory experience at that stage. Thank you. That That's really interesting. And, and uh, 
the key there is that the course, as you mentioned, was designed with your industry partners. So in terms of the career after completing this course, tell me just a little bit more about the type of jobs and maybe the companies within the area that uh, would be interested in this. So again, just following on from, from Owen, um, I mean, this is a very exciting time for the biopharmaceutical industry. It's a very challenging time, but, you know, but it provides a lot of opportunities for, for people to upskill and also to transfer into this industry. So traditionally, the biopharmaceutical manufacturing sector is very strong in Ireland. Um, it has an investment of over 10 billion in, in developing new facilities over the last 10 years in particular. Um, and as a sector, it's seeing very, very strong demand for new skills to be developed. Again, as our previous speakers like Patrick and, and Owen have been saying, you know, and this investment leads to, to basically new jobs and, and roles within the industry because it's such a diverse, um, you know, I suppose offering that's, that's, that's there now. This course, um, in terms of the, the postgrad uh, diploma in bioanalytical chemistry, it, it basically has been designed, you know, to enable graduates to meet these priority skills. Um, especially for the needs of the biopharmaceutical sector. So students on completion of the program, you know, they will have a broader awareness of bioanalytical technologies, especially the techniques that, that are being used, and they'll be better prepared as well to fulfill new and emerging roles. And this is important because a lot of these, you know, th there's a lot of new, new technologies being implemented um, by the biopharmaceutical companies, um, especially in things like quality assurance and quality control within that, that, that sector. So, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of um, opportunities and, and um, I suppose available to students who take this program. And the companies, like I said, this is industry driven. The companies are fully behind this and they, they really, um, you know, have, have put a massive endorsement in terms of, you know, helping us design the curriculum, you know, engaging with us in terms of being proactive in delivering it as well, um, especially facilitating the, the, the workshops and, and giving us a lot of content for helping us to, you know, move our, our, our delivery to a, to an online, um, I suppose, forum as such. Thank you so much, Eric. That was again really informative, and I think it uh, ties nicely with with also our next speaker that I would like to welcome uh, this afternoon, Dr. Patrick O'Dwyer, and he'll talk a little bit more about the pharmaceutical regulatory sciences and how it ties with uh, what uh, Owen and and Eric just have presented and kind of frame it for us a little bit as well. So welcome and thank you for joining us. And as I said, I will have similar questions uh, for you that I ask Eric. So for a science and engineering graduate, why would your course be stud uh, worth studying? Thanks very much, Lenka. I think this course offers a great opportunity to science and engineering graduates to upskill and move into the pharmaceutical industry. As new technologies and medicines emerge, it's vital that our methods of assessing these medicines also evolve to assure safe and effective drug products for patients. Regulatory science is the science behind the development of these new tools, standards, and approaches to assess medicines. These skills have been identified as a major skills gap in the Irish workforce. Science and engineering graduates with their strong backgrounds in maths and science are ideally placed to fill this very gap. This course has content from the School of Pharmacy, the School of Maths, and the School of Public Health here and has been designed to meet both the existing needs and the emerging trends of the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you. Uh, so how do you envision that you will bridge the gap between the theory? It sounds really theoretical, but then we have to have the practice. So how do you bridge the gap throughout the course? So this course will be delivered using an, uh, a blended format. So this means that it's a combination of online and face-to-face -face work. So the theoretical aspects, so the lectures will be delivered online. So students are free to look at these lectures at any time during the week. They're not, it's very flexible. There's no particular requirement for them to be online at a particular time. This theoretical work will be complemented by face-to-face -face workshops, which will take place on UCC campus on Thursday evening and a Friday afternoon. So in these workshops, students will apply the knowledge that they have learned in the lectures to more practical aspects. Then it joined the summer months, joined semester three. After the thought modules have finished, students will undertake an industrial based project. So again, they'll be applying their theoretical knowledge into a practical real world setting. 
And also, considering Cork is such a massive global, global hub for pharmaceuticals, we'll be tapping into this expertise. So we'll have a series of guest lectures, so they'll be giving us their practical insights. And we're also going to have a series of site tours, so again, improving the practical aspects for students. Exciting. So tell me a little bit more about the career opportunities. Who are our partners or where do you see the graduates from this course being employed then? I think some of this will overlap with a few of the previous contributors. Uh, Ireland is a massive uh, hub for pharmaceuticals. It's a major part of the Irish economy and it's a major employer in the Irish economy. Just for way of example, all 10 of the top pharmaceutical companies in the world are located in Ireland and pharmaceutical exports are worth about 50 billion annually to the Irish economy. So that's about a third of our total national exports. Even in this uh, COVID-19 world that we live in, recent figures show that Ireland's exports had increased by 8% in the first half of the year, which is way out of step with what happened with the rest of the world. And this increase was driven by the massive demand that there is globally for Irish pharmaceutical goods. As this is the first regulatory science course in Ireland, we anticipate that the graduates of this program will be really unique and that there'll be highly uh, high demand for these graduates, both regionally in the kind of Cork and Munster area, nationally in Ireland and internationally so we anticipate that there'll be a lot of highly skilled, well-paying jobs that will be resulting from this course. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you again for joining us here today and sharing more of these exciting news uh, about this course, which amazingly, as we mentioned, you know, all these courses are funded by the HEA. So uh, thank you again. And uh, let's uh, talk about our uh, sixth program. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Marguerite Nayan uh, to the session here today. And let's talk a little bit about the sustainability in enterprise course, meeting the challenges of the future. You know, sustainability and climate change often feature in the media these days. So how will this course further my understanding of these topics should I be the successful applicant here? Hi Lenka, thanks very much uh, for organising this event and for an opportunity to speak about our higher diploma in sustainability in enterprise. Um, our diploma, it's extremely timely and this is for a number of reasons. Firstly, our society now faces unprecedented climate and environmental challenges and also a growing public awareness of climate change and concerns over environmental sustainability are now pushing companies, enterprises and large organisations to place this environmental, environmental sustainability and decarbonisation at the heart of strategy, operations and decision making, um, while at the same time maximising profit profitability. So as such, you know, there's a growing number of enterprises across multiple sectors which require a skilled and knowledgeable workforce in environmental sustainability and decarbonisation. And likewise, those working in regulation or policy uh, need to have the right knowledge base to address the complexity of complexities of the very broad environmental sustainability challenge also. Another point is that uh, the transition towards a sustainable and zero carbon enterprise is one of the biggest opportunities for companies in the coming years. And this would be to drive innovation, increase competitiveness and stimulate growth. And successfully achieving this, ch this change to a zero carbon enterprise uh, requires not only radical technological innovations and new business models, but it also requires new skills. And these include the ability to combine and consider engineering, economic, social, managerial and environmental constraints, and the ability to embrace complexity and a systems thinking approach. Um, and because of that, we've designed an interdisciplinary higher diploma, and this is because the challenges of sustainability and the challenge of transitioning to a low carbon economy require very much an interdisciplinary approach. Um, so our diploma reaches across a number of colleges and disciplines in UCC. Um, we're offering modules in engineering, including in environmental engineering and sustainable energy, bioenergy and circular economy and sustainable industry. The business modules um, that we're offering will include sustainability in modern business, 
ethics and sustainability and environmental economics. And in terms of modules in sociology, we're also delighted to include a university-wide module which focuses on all aspects of sustainability related to the sustainable development goals. And this module has been a very successful and popular um, module within UCC over the past number of years. One final point to mention is that University College Cork is a global leader in sustainability and the Sustainability and Enterprise Higher Diploma leverages our extremely successful sustainability strategy and our green campus initiatives over the past number of years. It also leverages the interdisciplinary strengths and capacity developed by the Environmental Research Institute, which brings together 20 academic disciplines at UCC. Um, so with that, sustainability is at the core of all UCC strategies and activities, and that's why UCC is an excellent place to study sustainability in enterprise. I fully agree with you. And you kind of touched on it a little bit, talking about the different modules and what we'll be learning about. But what skills will uh, will I develop uh, if, if I am successful in, in, in applying for this course and starting it? Great question, Linka. Um, so the Sustainability and Enterprise Higher Diploma, it's a prestigious programme and the main objective is to produce a community of leaders equipped to, um, of course, lead the transition to sustainable enterprise practices through decarbonisation. And along with the focus on the technological and business challenges, um, the course also focuses on the leadership skills needed to deliver such a transition. The course really moves beyond issue-related knowledge uh, to problem-solving approaches that integrate systems thinking, futures thinking, strategic thinking and inter interdisciplinarity. Um, students will still gain insights into the, um, you know, the key principles and theories associated with environmental engineering, sustainable energy, business and management, uh, while also developing uh, the transferable leadership skills and the ability to um, identify innovative uh, sustainability frameworks. Um, so on completion of the program, graduates will be able to identify key challenges associated with environmental sustainability in business. They will be able to apply the problem solving skills needed to develop solutions for responding to environmental sustainability issues. The students will learn about the circular economy, decarbonizing energy systems, strategic sustainability thinking, and leadership and organizational change management. And finally, students will be able to combine and consider technological, economic, social, business, managerial, and environmental challenges in developing solutions for transitioning to environmentally sustainable and zero carbon business practices. So students will develop a number of sustainability skills and these will be extremely relevant to modern businesses, enterprises and large organizations also. Yeah, so that got me thinking, obviously. So how does it look uh, linked to the careers and to these businesses? What career opportunities are there? Who is looking for this skill set that we will now have? OK, uh, well, the overall aim of the program is to ensure that uh, graduates have the knowledge, skills and professional values required to be leaders in environmental sustainability. And the reason this course has been funded by the Irish Higher Education Authority is because there's a recognised skills gap in Ireland in the area of environmental sustainability and industry and enterprise. And there is huge demand internationally also. So in terms of careers, it could be in various companies where there is now a very strong focus on environmental sustainability and the transition to zero carbon operations um, from a technical, strategic and man managerial perspective. It might also be in sustainability leadership roles, or it might be in environmental management roles, but it could also be in government, in regulation and in policy. UCC has excellent connections with industry, so students will be able to leverage that while at UCC. And we have a very unique and prestigious program in terms of bringing together environmental engineering, energy, business and management. So graduates of the program would have a very competitive and unique set of skills for the job marketplace. Along with uh, climate change, the environment and decarbonisation being extremely topical and, and important at the moment, um, a new, this has been, and this has been echoed by the recent programme for government, uh, a new area of work has emerged since the COVID-19 pandemic emerged earlier this year, and that is in understanding how we can furthermore transition to a more environmentally sustainable society as we live with and we move forward from the COVID-19 pandemic. So our programme in, in 
in sustainability in enterprise will certainly give its participants the skills needed to be part of that important work. Thank you so so much and so timely. And again, this kind of brings us to the to the end of the chat with the directors about each of the courses, and you can see the relevancy of the the skills that we will be uh, bringing to to our students uh, in the future. So what we will do now is uh, let's. Uh, have a chat with Katie and Katie is our guru and knows a lot about uh, frequently asked questions and more importantly she also has the frequently asked answers for us. So Katie will we take a question at the time? Uh, one of the typical questions is uh, people have been asking us because some of them are obviously in employment and they are wondering uh, as these courses have been initially positioned as full-time courses how much uh, bandwidth uh, is there uh, to continue studying while working. Absolutely. Thanks, Lenka. Um, to be honest, this is one of the questions that I get asked the most. Um, muchly through email, people are, people are working hard at the moment from home remotely and, and otherwise. So these classes are, as you said, um, these programs are classified as full-time programs. Um, in terms of the time commitment that you could expect from these programs, they are going to be delivered flexibly to meet the needs of people who are employed. Um, we are very understanding of the fact that people who are in, in, in employment want to upskill, they want to expand their professional development, they want to be able to change career. Um, especially with COVID and everything that's happening at the moment, it's a, it's a good opportunity. Um, people are at home working remotely, there's a new way of working, there's a new dynamic anyway. Um, so it's good to be able to capitalise on that if you have the opportunity. So whether or not you'll be able to complete one of these programs is very dependent on your personal circumstances and your capacity with your current workload. So you could expect in terms of your contact hours, and I'll explain that in a, in a little while, your contact hours per week could range, depending on the program, between 10 hours and 16 to 17 hours per week. Um, so your contact hours basically are the amount of time that you can expect to spend um, watching lectures online, interacting with any online groups you have to do, participating in any lab work, um, even though that might be, um, I suppose, together in a block towards the semester two portion of your course. Um, and then obviously outside of that, there would be time that you'd have to dedicate for self-directed study. That would be very much dependent on the course um, material that you may have covered already as part of your current or existing role. Um, so in terms of contact hours, as I said, kind of 10 to 16 to 17 hours contact a week, and then self-directed learning on top of that. So if you were to be working full-time and potentially managing this on the side for, for a short period of time, that, that might be manageable depending on your own personal circumstances as well. Thank you, that makes sense. And obviously uh, your employer may, may be only willing to make allowances for you because of the set is you know, uh, increasing. Mm -hmm. Now, another question is, uh, if I'm on a job seekers uh, related payment, will I be able to keep it if I start our one of the HCI courses? Um, at risk of sounding like a politician, there's no direct clear answer for that. Um, so at the moment, if you are on a job seekers payment, there's a couple of different types of payments out there. So it very much depends on the payment that you're on. So if you have been in receipt of a job seekers payment for nine of the previous 12 months, you may be eligible for the back to education allowance. OK. So that's typically what happens if you fall within that nine to 12 month um, bracket. Now, we're very cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of people since the start of the pandemic who are now gone onto a COVID-19 payment. Um, and as part of the July stimulus package, the government announced that they, that they would extend the back to education allowance to those who are currently on the COVID-19 um, PUP or pandemic unemployment payment. What I would advise people to do is to touch base with their local um, Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection office um, or their local Intrio centre just to double check their entitlements because the back to education allowance is contingent on a number of other factors as well. Um, in terms of the subsidies for the course, if you are on a COVID-19 um, pandemic payment, you would be required to pay 10% of the course fee, which is the government subsidy would cover the remaining 90%. Um, and then if you continue to remain in unemployment at registration for the course, which would be the beginning to the middle of September, then you would receive that 10% back. 
Um, and depending on your circumstances, you may be entitled then to move on to the back to education allowance. So um, in short, nine to 12 months is your most likely, um, the most clear cut answer is if you've been on for nine to 12 months on a DESP benefit, then you may be entitled and then with the COVID payment as well. So do touch base with your local DESP office just to, to double check the finer point on that. Thank you, Katie. And there is a lot of information that you have just given us. So we will also capture this in our uh, FAQ document. The DESP have a, a great um, FAQ website on the Back to Education Allowance and the Citizens Information pages online as well actually um, have some really um, very easy to find information that's that's chunked quite nicely as well. That's perfect. Can I ask you just another question? So we, uh, we have covered the one about COVID payment, but uh, if uh, for people that are not Irish, uh, can can uh, we still apply for a HCI course? Do we need to be from the EU or international or how does it work? So the HCI programs are subsidies and the subsidies that are available for these HCI programs um, would be applicable if you are Irish, um, EU, Swiss um, or a UK passport holder. They'd also be applicable if you've been resident within Ireland for three of the last five years and have a, um, an eligible visa. So at the moment, the eligible visa would be the Stamp 4 um, residency visa or a Stamp 4 family visa if your spouse or partner um, has a, a Stamp 4 visa and you've travelled with them. Um, you would have to provide proof of residency in order to be fully accepted onto the programmes. That would happen a little bit later on in the application process. Um, and you would have to furnish proof that you've been in the country for three of the last five years in order in order to receive the subsidies. Mm -hmm. And uh, you kind of touched on that just slightly, but what happens if I find employment while studying a HCI course? So if I'm unemployed or I'm on COVID, but then I do find employment, what will happen to me then? Well, first of all, if you do, that's fantastic. And congratulations if you're on, on the way to finding employment. Um, nothing will change in terms of your HCI course. So once you're eligible for that HCI course at the start of the course, you can continue to, to, to finish out that course on the funding model that, that you've joined and been a part of. Um, obviously being mindful of your working hours and everything else, but, but fantastic, we'd be delighted if that happened for you. Thank you. Another question that we have here on the screen, and it's kind of relating to a lot of the questions that are live in the chat is, you know, are all the HCI courses online? What is the structure kind of of the course? How are we processing the applications and so on? Mm -hmm. Since you are so close to all of this, would you just give us a kind of an, a generic update on a lot of the... Yeah, uh, there. I've jotted a few of them down beside me here. So if you see me looking down, that, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm looking through. So firstly, the application process. So just to give you a quick overview, these applications are being processed through the Springboard um, platform. So Springboard, obviously, people might be familiar with it, um, offer hundreds and uh, thousands of, of free places every year. So applications are being processed through that. Um, and they're being processed by UCC and many other universities on what we call a rolling applications basis. So as we get the, the applications through, we, we process a certain number of them. Now, processing times can differ. Um, depending on your entry routes. So we would have a mainstream um, entry route whereby people are assessed um, based on their academic uh, qualifications and their personal statements. And then what we, ha we have what we call a recognition of prior learning route, which um, allows us to take into consideration industry experience, um, prior qualifications where you may not necessarily meet the level eight um, mainstream qualification route. That's a fantastic entry route if you've been in an industry for a couple of years, if you've done maybe a certificate um, or a diploma or a degree in another discipline and, and you're trying to trying to carve a path for yourself into something new. Um, so we have that um, process in place. It does take a little bit longer. So application times vary on a case by case basis, but we would hope to have all applications completely processed, obviously, just shortly after the closing date of the 1st of September. Um, then in terms of, I know that there was one question in earlier on in terms of the English language requirements for postgraduates. So if you're not um, a native English language speaker, what you need to do is provide um, proficiency, a proficiency certification in English language, basically, 
What we'll do is when we compile the FAQ documents, we pop in the link for the postgraduate English language requirements. If you don't have, um, say, for example, a valid um, IELTS test, um, an English language test, what you can do and what's being accepted by the university at the moment is a Duolingo test. So you can complete one of those online um, and upload it as part of your application. It would need to meet the Duolingo um, scoring requirements that will all be outlined on the postgraduate um, link that we'll include in there. So that's just an alternative if you're if you're looking for language requirements, because I know that the IELTS testing centers and everything, they're, they're not running testing at the moment. Um, it's a bit of a challenge with the, the current situation, but there are alternatives available. And then another question was just around assessments. Um, and assessments will vary program to program, module to module, depending on coordinators um, for the programs and depending on module coordinators as well. Many of the modules will have continuous assessment, project work group projects that will need to be submitted. I would imagine a lot of the more um, the chemical and, and bioanalytical and biopharma courses may have some hands on practical labs. I'm not too sure how, how those assessments will work. Um, there may be some examinations as well, again, depending on the modules. UCC is fully equipped and, and has managed online examinations for both summer and autumn examinations this year already. Um, so we'll probably continue to do that. Um, should anything happen in relation to further lockdowns, UCC is preparing itself, obviously, to go fully online with any of these programmes across you know, the whole university. Um, insofar as possible. So we're, we're, we're well kitted out for that already at the moment. Um, so obviously, if you would like more information in terms of assessments or how things like that are managed, if you want to have a look at the um, programme pages or get in touch with any of the course directors or myself, um, if you have any concerns around assessments or anything, we'd be more than happy to, to assist there. I think they were all the questions that I had written down on this side. If there were any more... Um, just a question around access to the Bula Library. Yes. So access. So when, when you become um, a student um, and when you're accepted into one of these programs and you register, you are a full time UCC student and you will have access to as much of campus is as safe and practical to open during COVID. So, yes, you will have access to the Bula Library and um, much of it is online as well, which is great. Um, so there's a lot of online um, journals, archives and everything there that you can access. Um, I'm not sure how they're, I know that the Boole is open at the moment and they are facilitating physical entry as well, which is fantastic for now. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are right uh, on the hour. I would like to thank everybody that has been here today with me presenting. I'd like to thank most importantly to our audience. We hope that you have uh, found out uh, the answers to majority of your questions. As mentioned, we will uh, generate an FAQ document and provide you with a lot of information. Katie and her team are looking at the applications together with the course directors. Uh, check us out on the www.ucc.ie forward slash HCI. That's the landing page where you have all these six courses. Then the application process is through the Springboard website. Spread the word about these courses to your friends and family, uh, ex-classmates, whoever you know, who may be looking just for that uh, little advantage to get their career moving in a new direction, right direction, an exciting direction. A lot of these courses, I, I'm kind of considering giving up my job in UCC and go studying there. They sound absolutely fantastic. And somehow it's all interlinked and you could be interested in one, two or three of them, you know, and it would be no surprise. So thank you to the HEA uh, as well and to the government of Ireland for providing this opportunity for, for us. And uh, everybody have a great afternoon and stay in touch. And we hope to welcome you as our students in the future. Have a good afternoon.